Today, we're going to be hearing about the importance or the power of storytelling. All of us love a good story, but storytelling is more than just entertainment. Storytelling is sharing experiences, helping us to connect with each other, learning about new things, exposing different points of view, preserving family and cultural history, and I could go on. Storytelling is essential. It's a fundamental activity that offers benefits to individuals and to the total society. Today we've asked Doreen Cumberford, I, I thought I would get that correct, Cumberford to share her insights on storytelling with us. Doreen is an author of First Life in the Camel Lane, Embrace Your Adventure. This is also available, well, it's available here, but it's also available in, in the bookstore here at the, at the library. She also wrote Arriving Well. And next year she has another book coming out, which is Life in the Reentry Lane, The Expat's Guide to Returning Well. Doreen is a native of Scotland. She's lived in eight different countries around the world over four, dec four decades and four continents. She and her husband, our own John Palmer, uh, arrived in San Miguel almost exactly one year ago. She con still considers herself a newbie. We don't consider that. But she considers herself a newbie, and she's exploring her life here in San Miguel. So Doreen, welcome, and we can't wait to hear Hi. There was a fellow in a country, let's not say where, and he opened the newspaper one day and he was out of a job. He needed a job, so he opened the newspaper and there was an ad. Confidentiality required $1,000 per day. And he was very interested. He got really interested in this. So he thought, I'll go apply for that job. So he went and applied for the job, and the job was at the zoo. And the zoo had lost the gorilla. The gorilla had escaped. And the zoo was terrified. They thought they were in for all these sorts of problems. And they said, we can't tell the citizens. We have to find the gorilla. Until we find the gorilla, we're looking for one. So he took the job and they sent him to gorilla school. And that was a culture shock. And he learned how to swing. And he was very good at swinging. And then he learned how to beat his chest. And he learned how to make gorilla noises. And that was all going very well until one day he swang a little bit too far and he ended up in the lion's den. <laughs> and this great bulky lion with this huge red mane stalked over to him and said, shh, would you shut up? You'll get us all fired. <laughs> so that's how I feel today. I feel like I have imposter syndrome. I should be sitting there, you should be, you should be here. We're talking today about culture, and chameleons. I've probably been here the least of all of you in this room, and I feel very honored to be fortunate enough to be connected to this organization. Um, culture changes us, whether we're aware of it or not. The culture that we create is normally of a self-creation and it's bits and information that we put together about the world in our brain. So if you look at our brain, the part of our brain that stores culture is the visual cortex and the visual association area, the green part at the back. So why don't you just give that little piece of your brain a little love, come on, play along. It really makes a difference. If you tap every day, or you talk to that little part of your brain, 
it can actually assist you in a little bit of assimilation. So culture is really important. We don't, we're not always aware how it's affecting us. And storytelling is part of my job, but it's not all most of my job. Mostly I'm talking about the subject that no one in this room wants to talk about. And that's expatriation and going home. It's kind of the underbelly of the expat experience. And I know we're not going to go there today. You'll be glad to hear. OK, let's talk about Rotary. John and I became more familiar with Rotary when um, I was doing a book tour for Life in the Camel Lane. And we went to club after club after club. We must have spoken to about 30 clubs. John at that time had a talk called Global Cooling. Not global warming, but global cooling. And I was talking, they kind of twinned us, they got two for one. And I was talking about life in the camel lane and how we can use uh, culture to tell stories and how we can be, live in a more connected world. And one of the things that I learned about Rotary then was that we love to tell stories in Rotary. Who heard a story before they walked in the room this morning? Who heard more than two stories this morning? Now, I have had Ron, uh, Jill, Lee, um, Dorothy, all tell me stories that I can repeat back to you in the last two weeks. So what, do, what does that tell you about the importance of those stories? They carry the weight of our traditions. They carry the weight and they preserve the traditions and the culture that exist here in Rotary. They also express our identity. So I have a very mixed up identity and it's great to live in a community where there are others who also have a mixed up identity. If we were to be able to unzip you and look inside your heart, we would look at, I like to imagine the flags on people's souls. Because I really believe that culture makes an imprint on our souls. And we talk a lot in, in the circles I move in about being global hearted. And Rotary is very, very good about l allowing everyone to freely uh, express your identity. The other thing it does is it builds shared understanding because sometimes we have very uneven experiences. John and I lived in Saudi for 15 years. And so when I say to people I lived in Saudi for 15 years, they go, oh, oh, it's like that must have been a hard thing, a difficult thing, a challenging thing. Women can't drive. You have to be dressed in black. The women are all you know, really subjugated. Well, that's part of the story. But that is not all the story, which is why I wrote Life in the Camel Lane. And through Life in the Camel Lane, it's been a great project because it's really helped people to understand Saudi Arabia and to understand how we could go there and morph a little bit and change in order to maybe not identify with their ways or accept their ways, but at least understand their ways. Storytelling also is a great way of communicating. Some of us tell stories with pictures. Some of us are more auditory, so we talk about the explosions we heard or the booms we heard this morning, right? Some of us are more kinesthetic so we're constantly talking about how something felt or what we touched or what that experience was. And finally, storytelling shapes the culture. So I would like, oops, what do stories do for us? This is just going to be really fast because you already got the meat. They improve our understanding. They enhance our memory. 
The story that Dorothy told me about the flood at her house before she put on the step up, step down event landed. A story that Ron told me about living in LA in the 70s landed. So it's not just our job to deliver stories, it's also our job to take them in. And the way that we take them in and the meaning that we give them affects our culture. They help us enhance our memory. And I lie in bed sometimes thinking, what was that story that person told me? Because I know that I need help with my memory. Facilitate our learning about each other, the increase the connections and the access emotions. The other thing that I hear a lot of in San Miguel is how we identify social change. What does social change look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Because stories can make us stop and actually let things into that hidden part of us that we can't unzip and show to the world. Next. Um, all right, our brains. I was talking to a friend last week who's a neuroscientist, and um, he told me something that I'd never known, that stories are lodged in four different parts of your brain. And that's one of the reasons that since the caveman days, we wanted to tell the stories. Because our brain uses 20% of our energy every day. It's locked in a very dark cage. It has no way of knowing anything except through our visual, through our eyes. So the brain, it seeks, it's, it's like a little amoeba. It wants to grow and it grows with stories. And so as we tell our stories effectively and make meaning with them, it can also help to heal your brain. The brain will do the easiest thing possible. So if you give the brain three tasks, it will do, always do the easiest thing. And in many cases, telling stories is easy. I've got too much information. My husband, who is a slide presenter, approved my slides, but I have too much information, honey. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be a test. Are you all ready for a test? Diego, are you ready? All right, this is a selective attention test. And with Diego's help, you're about to see a small video. And I want you to listen to the instructions. Count the number of times the people in the white team throw the basketball. So you're going to be looking for the people in the white team, and you're going to count the number of times they shoot the basketball. Mutter, mutter, mutter around yourselves. What have we learned so far? Let's cover. <laughs> what have we covered? We have covered the fact that the, um, the brain lives in a dark corner. How many places does it store stories? Why this is, is a test of selective attention. Good. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla?
This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks. Thank you, Diego, for um, embedding that for us. And the thank you, Diego, for all you do to help us here at every meeting. Thank you. So right here in this room, we've got two different stories. How many people saw the gorilla? How many people didn't see the gorilla? So if the gorilla people and the non-gorilla people were talking to each other, they might not have the same story, correct? So no matter how similar we are, um, no matter if we speak the same language, we have the same background, we uh, make these assumptions about culture, and we live in these cultural assumptions every single day here, I just want to point out that we've got to keep life interesting. So just watch out for those gorillas. Yeah. <laughs> they might hang out on Relo one day, or you never know, at the Hardeen. So stories are universal. We help us understand our place in the world. Now, my place in the world is the brand, pers brand new person on the block. I walk around San Miguel feeling like I should have an L on my forehead. In Scotland, where I grew up, we have a big red L on the back of a car when you're learning to drive. <laughs> and I walk around consciously with that L because I'm always thinking, what am I not seeing? What do I not understand about this? What do I need to learn? And above all, what, do the what does the Mexican culture have to teach me? So who in this room has been taught something by Mexican culture? Look at the hands. So what a gift, right? They also help us understand our place in the world. Well, I don't know where my place in the world is. The, my, the most scary per question you can ask me is, where are you from? And I go, Robbins asked me, where are you from? And I just back up. I'm like, I, I don't know. And there are many people like that. And I would like to bring your attention to the fact that there are lots of um, younger couples who are raising children here now in San Miguel who are not Mexicans. And those children are what we call TCKs. They are third culture kids who are being raised outside the culture of their parents. These children will be very advantaged in many ways. They will have access to languages. They will have access to culture. They will have access to politics in a way that someone from a monoculture does not have. But recently, we have discovered, the, scientific, the scientists have discovered that these kids have more ACEs than other kids, adverse uh, experiences, adverse childhood experiences. And so I just say that it does take a village, and let's be that village to those kids, because um, we can model and we can do things for the whole community. Just like Rotary, you are all modeling for not only the Mexicans and not only the expats, but also you're a terrific model for being a great Rotary Club for Rotary International, which is already a multicultural institution. They also help to shape our perspective. So do you have a little different perspective having seen that video, whether you saw a gorilla or not? <laughs> and they help us listen and understand our perspectives. Stories pass down our morals, the things that we believe and the things that we understand about the world. Um, our daughter, one daughter grew up in America, one daughter grew up in Saudi Arabia. Very, very different experiences and very, very different people with different stories, different perspectives. And it's fascinating to hear their commentary about their upbringing. And they were not simultaneous. We don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> 
also, stories, like I said, they stimulate these different parts of our brain. And they are really important. And you don't have to be that good. So what's your story? How many of you here are conscious of the fact that you tell the same stories over and over, that you have your pet stories? <laughs> oh, yes, an Irishman there, Michael Murphy. We would be having the stories. We would be having the stories. Like Scottish, we have our stories. We tell the same stories over and over, you know the clearings and how they wouldn't let us wear the tartan and, you know, how bad the English are. I mean, that's still all impregnated in the back of my brain and that green part from school. So what is your story? You can tell your story lots of different ways. I'm just here to urge you to consider your story and to consider the value that lies there, therein and the treasure that you are each of you is a walking library. The question is, what books in the library are you going to share? You can tell, do a novel, you can do a short story, you can write poetry, you can go to the San Miguel Writers Conference and suffer through a week of poetry writing. Um, my poetry was amazingly good, but then it went away. Uh, <laughs> so you have to stick with it. Film, animation, photography, dance, and improvisation. Those are all different ways of telling a story. It doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be... It doesn't need to be professional. It just needs to be exercised, because in the exercise, exorcism of that story, builds the connection and the love and the camaraderie and the strength that you offer the community because you are a structure for culture to flow into the community. How am I doing? Am I doing okay on time? So how would you like to tell your story? You knew there would be a catch at the end of this, right? So there's different ways to do so. Podcasts, radio drama, audiobooks, video games, virtual reality, augmented re I don't need to read that. Why am I reading a slide, John? <laughs> I haven't spoken in a while. So actually, telling your story, we would like to give you an invitation for you to tell your story. The best practices learn about the culture, the customs, the communication styles that you're surrounded by, and be patient and respectful. So every one of you here has not just one point of view. You bring different points of view. And even every day of the week, you might bring a different point of view, because we're humans. And I think celebrating the joy of humanity and being human is really one of the big lessons of, for me for being here in Mexico. So um, my partner and I, my Vanna White and I, stand up. <laughs> this is my partner, Sharon Fields. And Sharon and I are establishing a podcast because we wanted to tell stories, but we wanted it to be stories of intercultural communication. So we have a podcast that is just a baby. If you go online, you won't even find it because we haven't even birthed it yet, but we do have some recordings. The recordings to date have been people who have been intercultural trainers, some of my university professors in intercultural communications, um, teachers, who else have we had, Sharon? A minister, yes. Wives of expats, serial wives of expats. <laughs> Third culture kid experts, yeah. And uh, Lisa Lang, who has a streamable video that you can download. Uh, it's called The Alien Experience. And um, she has a super story about expats. And now she helps people write one woman stories or one men stories, one, prefer, one performance at a time. So we have 10 spots available 
we're going to put out a series of podcasts that are based on people who live in San Miguel. Now, this is not tourism. This is not, please, y'all come to San Miguel. This is about what have we learned as a result of living on this land, and how can we make a difference as a result of that? So we've got 10 podcast record spots. We're recording in early December. Each of them is a conversation. This is not a performance. We ask you a little bit about the story and what's meaningful to you and how San Miguel has changed you or how you feel you've changed San Miguel. And then we are going to release those sometime between May and July next year, a day at a time here. But this is a baby thing, and we want this to be very um, community-centric. So if you have a story that you would like to tell, please come and, and talk to the lovely Sharon today, <laughs> because uh, she can sign you up for a recording. And number two, if you'd just like to know when it's going to be out, please see John. He has a form. If you'd like to be on the list, we're letting people know. We have, we have 19 followers. <laughs> so to, today, we would like to leave with, um, what, 25 or 30? So how far can you push our, you know, the limits? I mean, we are a baby podcast, but we intend for this to be a way that people can understand culture, appreciate culture, and understand that a life well spent is sometimes a life that is moved to another country. So I'd just like to finish with this quote. That's us. After nourishment, shelter, companionship, and I might add sleep, Stories are the things that we need most in the world. So we urge you, when you feel like the world is rolling their eyes in the face of your story, find someone else to tell it to. When you feel like there's too many stories coming in from outside online, listen to your own heart. In intercultural communication, we talk about your heart, your headset, which is your thinking, your heart set, which is your feeling, and your hand set, which is your action. When all three of these are in alignment, you will find that you live a more fun life because you have access to your unique and unrepeatable identity and your unique and unrepeatable stories. I wish you well. Please come talk to us. We have time for a couple of questions. Anybody have a question for Doreen? I guess you said it all, Doreen. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. wait, wait. Why did you live in Saudi Arabia? Uh, the, fellow in, the fellow in the front row was the job. I, I had been a junior diplomat with the British Foreign Service, and that was almost my first serious job out of university. And I had lived in London, Cameroon, West Africa, and Dubai. And then I had come to the US. That's where I met John. And I became not the diplomat, I had to transition to become a trailing spouse. And yes, with child, small child. Child was 21 days old when we interviewed. And so I followed him to Saudi Arabia and it was an amazingly transformative experience that forever I am so grateful for. And I miss it every single day. Yes. I see that you have your book there. How much do you want for your book? I don't know. <laughs> oh, 
it, in the in the biblioteca they sell it for 400 pesos. These are going to the bibli. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go to the biblioteca because I'm, I'm only selling through them because I want to make a difference for the biblioteca and the writing community. Anyone else? Thank you again. You're welcome. Doreen, thank you so very much. I made, I made up a story this morning. So you can invent stories, they don't have to be. And then they come true. Because I made up a story that Doreen was gonna be one of our best speakers this year. And you were. I think that was a great, great, thank you so much.